So we can go through any of any of those either either just I, I can go straight through all of the material that we've talked about so far in the class or if you have specific questions on practice problems on homework problems or on individual concepts out of the lecture so far uh, we can talk about those so what would you all prefer How many other people also want me to just go through material? Can we do like a cool. 30, 20? So figure out what we need to know and then do some examples the last few minutes? Sure. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. I don't, uh, I don't have any examples prepared other than the practice problems that I gave out. But we can talk through those individually or concepts in the homework or um, examples that I gave in class before we can pull go through. And that would all be fine. Okay, so let's do that. So, so I noticed at least yesterday the uh, type lecture notes weren't up to date necessarily. Uh, yeah. Um, could you just remind us of what you have to speed on as far as the midterm goes in relation with the lectures? Yeah. So the, the last lecture, or the last couple lectures were on different loading states, so tension, torsion, and bending, and the plasticity there. Don't worry about that for the midterm. Um, I'll try to get the lecture notes updated soon. I just have been busy with other things. But yeah, those basically everything that's in the lecture notes so far up till yield surfaces, um, you should know. And I, and I think that lecture is up to date in the, in the notes. That includes factors. Yes. Oh. Yeah. I guess I didn't update factor of safety. So yeah. Three yield surfaces and factor of safety don't necessarily worry about the plastic plasticity that forms uh, for torsion and bending, but do know if you were to have a, something that was torqued or bent uh, when yielding would initiate. <coughs> but for that, you need to know what the failures, what the stress is, and then. Uh, it, it would be a, a yield surface or factor of safety argument, not necessarily how it develops in that uh, in that loading state in particular. Okay, yeah, but I'll, I'll try to update that as soon as I can. <laughs> um, okay, so let's go through stuff. So we went through at the very beginning of the class. We talked about different materials. And we kind of gave an overview of that. So in general, know that brittle materials fail in tension. Uh, brittle fails in tension. And that's because of all the cracks and voids that basically you have fracture starting in the material and those, those fr that fracture nucleates primarily in tension. Um, while you have for ductiles, Ductile materials generally fail in shear. Uh, for ductile materials, so this is this is via uh, dislocations, dislocations, and grain boundary sliding, uh, which I'm going to call GB. GB sliding. Uh, for ductile materials or metals, we also have a hall patch effect. I'll patch effect, meaning that smaller grains are stronger. Grains are stronger because it, it makes it more just difficult for dislocations to move through there. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so, so no, then, so I guess these concepts then relate later to when we have stresses. If you can describe it, that's fine. So, like memorizing the name, Hall Patch. Yeah, it's okay. Just know that smaller grains are stronger, and that was one of the homework problems too. Um, yeah. So as long as you can describe the the concept and why it happens, yeah, you don't need to necessarily know the name. Uh, but so these these two come up are are they're important later on when you look at failure surfaces of materials. So that's why. When I twist the chalk, it fails at a 45 degree, and when I 
twist, it, uh, I guess next week you'll see when we do our torsion test, when you twist a metal rod, it should fail on a flat surface because it's failing in shear, not in tension. Um, so this is this brittle and ductile failure comes in when you are looking at your failure surfaces and, and the mechanism for failure. Um, look, we looked at stress, stress and strain. And for those, uh, we wrote out stresses and strains as that tensor, uh, or as that matrix, Y, Z, X, Y, X, Z, Y, Z. Strain is something similar, X, X, that I'm not going to write out. Uh, know the difference between engineering strain and normal strain. Epsilon X, Y, uh, and generally understand why that definition comes up, which was again one of the homework problems, even though I fudged that one up a whole lot and kept making errors. Uh, understand, so so once we had that stress, we, we looked into how to transform it. So there was a few different ways that we looked into stress, a few different methods for stress transformation. We had just stress transformation equations, so transformations. We had uh, like our sigma x prime was that one half sigma x plus sigma y, uh, one half sigma x minus sigma y cosine of two theta plus sigma x y sine of two theta. So I, I gave a few equations for these and there was similar types of equations for sigma y prime and sigma x prime. You can also look at it in terms of a more circle. Um, so when we have some arbitrary um, sigma x and then sigma x y, I guess x x x y, um, you can use that to figure out what the stress in some new orientation is, some distance two theta away using that more circle analysis, sigma and tau. You can also use this more circle, so we can say now uh, the center of the circle and the radius of the circle are that sigma x plus sigma y over two, and our radius is that uh, square root of sigma x minus sigma y over 2 squared plus x y squared. From there we could find our principal stresses, sigma 1 and 2 is that center plus or minus the radius. Um, and you can figure out what angle away then your principal stresses are uh, from the initial stress that you had based on a, an arc tangent of the thing, which I don't actually have written down anymore. Uh, I'm not going to write down the equation because I'm probably going to mess it up. But you can use either Moore's circle or um, or transformations to figure out where your principal stresses are. You can also do this equivalently by finding eigenvalues. So you can use eigenvalues, uh, eigenvalues, uh, and eigenvectors to also find your principal stresses and your principal stress directions. Uh, and that's another equivalent way of, of doing that, where if you feel more comfortable taking eigenvalues and eigenvectors, that works. Uh, you can also use your stress matrix and apply, in, instead of applying these equations, you can say the stress in the transformed coordinate is some rotation matrix times your stress times that rotation matrix and, uh, where that rotation matrix is some cosine theta minus sine of theta sine of theta cosine of theta so basically there's, there's a whole bunch of ways to um, rotate stress around in space and to figure out what principal stresses are and what principal stress directions are these are all equivalent. Would we be expected to use the matrix 
I, uh, you don't have to use any one of these in particular, just be sure to know at least one of them well. Um, and stress, th there will definitely be a stress transformation problem and a problem where you have to figure out principal strains and or principal stresses and principal stress directions. Um, so any one of these works, just whichever one you're most comfortable with, basically. Yeah. So you don't have a cheat sheet or these equations provided on the exam? You get a one page, one side handwritten uh, note sheet for the exam, which, did I send out an announcement about that on campus at all? Maybe not. Uh, single sided. <laughs> Did I say double sided? No. Uh, <laughs> I'll send out an announcement on Canvas just to clarify uh, in case, I don't know, people forgot or anything. Uh, yeah, one page, one sided, handwritten. Uh, I posted the solutions for one, two, and three, uh, and I haven't posted because it was due today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I'll post that probably sometime tonight. Would you mind just briefly explaining what's more of that relationship between gamma XY plus T XY? Oh, this one? Yeah, yeah. This is a it's a it's a kind of semantic definition, but uh, basically when a long time ago when people defined shear uh, or shear modulus. So we they took, if you apply some tau to a material, you can say that the relationship between the amount that it deflects uh, and the applied shear force is related by a shear modulus. So that this is how we're defining shear modulus G. Uh, but then when you actually want to make this a strain tensor or a strain matrix, you want that to be symmetric. So in order to make it symmetric, you take this and then you rotate it. So instead of gamma over two, uh, instead of gamma, you rotate this whole body by gamma over two and gamma over two. So these are these are the same thing. You're applying the same amount of strain, but you're in one direction. You're, you're rotating one slightly to make it symmetric, so that your epsilon x y is equal to your epsilon y x. Y, X. Yeah. So it's a weird definition that becomes important later on when you're looking at uh, strain, uh, looking at constitutive laws and uh, specifically how to relate shear stress to shear strain. Because then, depending on whether I'm talking about engineering shear strain or shear strain, I would use G or 2G to relate that to my shear stress. So it's, it's something that's just going to be a perpetual point of confusion because forever ago people defined things weird and now it's just the way it is. Okay, cool. More questions on things. All right. So we talked about elasticity, so constitutive laws. Elasticity. Do, do, do. For that, we gave, or I gave, uh, basically, so uh, there was a few relationships that are useful. So you know, for an ice, basically for elasticity, we, we primarily talked about isotropic, isotropic and homogeneous, homogeneous materials. Uh, and we said for an isotropic homogeneous material, all of the out of all the elastic constants, you only need to know two of them, and that relates to all of the other elastic constants you would need. So there's like Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio, which are pretty standard. Uh, you can from there determine what your shear modulus is, e over two times one plus nu. Yes, uh, your bulk modulus, which is e over 3 times 1 minus 2 nu, and Lemay constant, which is nu e over 1 plus 2, uh, 1 plus nu, 1 minus 2 nu. 1 plus nu, 1 minus 2 nu. So these relationships are generally useful to know. There'll probably be something related to this on the exam.
there's oh, up here, here da, da, da. right so uh, then what we use these constants for is relating stress and strain so uh, there's the definitions for uniaxial stress and strain which we kind of want to surpass here in this class and we want to look into the full 3D version of Hooke's Law. So we say our uh, strains in terms of our stresses, so strain in the x direction is 1 over e sigma x minus nu sigma y plus sigma z. Um, and there's equivalent ones for y, y, and z, z, and then um, epsilon x, y, or yes, epsilon x, y is um, 1 over 2 g sigma x, y, or gamma x, y is equal to sigma x, y over g. So this is that weird semantic definition or semantic change between engineering shear strain and shear strain. Uh, and there's an equivalent one for xz and yz. Then we can relate that all. We, you can either use uh, these these 3D Hooke's laws, e 3D Hooke's law equations, or you can write out the full matrix representation of it and say, or well, first, um, we can relate this in terms of stress and say, stress in the x is 2g epsilon plus lambda x plus y plus z. And the reason we use this is because the equations get really long and ugly otherwise. And so these are convenient substitutions to make them simpler. Um, and then sigma xy is just 2g epsilon xy um, for gamma xy g again that same definition there the so you can either use this set of equations for relating stresses and strains or you can use the full stiffness compliance tensors so we say that stress is related to uh, C epsilon C for stiffness or epsilon is related to S Sigma S for compliance because again, I don't know, maybe solid mechanicians a hundred years ago were just screwing with everyone. Um, but so here, the this sigma we could then write out in what we call Voigt notation. One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, and this is equal to, uh, we can write out a big relationship for stuff. E over 1 minus nu 1 plus 2 nu plus 2 nu 1 minus nu 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 1 minus nu nu and a whole bunch of zeros everywhere else. Lots and lots and lots of zeros everywhere. More zeros everywhere around here. And then there would be your strains here on the side. Epsilon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So we talked through this. We gave an anisotropic version. Um, but I don't necessarily expect you to know it for the midterm, or you're probably not going to be using an anisotropic version for the midterm. Um, so don't worry too much about that. It's kind of just important to know in general, and I guess for the tension lab, it's useful to be thinking about stri uh, stiffness anisotropically, stiffness in terms of anisotropic elastic constants. Cool. Um, so questions there, thoughts, concerns? on elasticity. All right. Um, we talked about bending. Bending. So 
uh, the main things we gave a couple of relationships for three and four point bending, which you've also now used fairly extensively in the labs. Uh, fix that. That's a roller. So we gave three point and four point definitions there. Da, da, da. Uh, so, in general, know the, the equations or the relationships for deflection of these locations of maximum stress. So, uh, no shear moment uh, and deflection, know that the stress is equal to mz uh, over i. Uh, know that i is bh cubed over 12 for a rectangle or pi over 4r to the fourth for a circle. Uh, so in general for, for three-point bending know that the moment is maximal in the center and that the moment is equal throughout the whole center section here. The shear is zero in the center section um, and so if you were to have a bar in three or four point bending know where where the maximum stress would be and how to calculate out that maximum stress um, based on the loading situation. Uh, what else do you need to know? The, the stress is uniform in the body. If we have stress here and z we assume the stress is uniform around the neutral axis and zero at the center of the neutral axis. And then you have tension and compression on both sides of the beam. Um, tension, compression, depending on whether the bar is in, uh, depending on which one is acting on the bar. Uh, what else do you need to know for bending? I think that's about it. So I'm not going to write out all of the relationships or all of the graphs for these, but um, they should be pretty well documented in all of your notes in your lab. Uh, then last, let's talk about yield surfaces. So uh, we talked about plasticity and uh, elastic, perfectly plastic, elastic hardening. Uh, don't worry about that too much for this la uh, for the midterm, but do know yield surfaces and different definitions for uh, different types of materials and what failure surfaces apply. So uh, we had a max normal condition, max normal stress, uh, which normally applies for brittle materials, and we say failure happens when you exceed sigma 1, sigma 2. Everything is plotted in principal stress space. So this is again where finding principal stresses is, is likely going to come in. Um, we say that failure happens when we exceed whatever that yield surface is. Sigma yield in tension, sigma yield in compression. This um, versus this. If the if the stress exceeds the yield surface, then I say my material fails. If it's inside, then it survives. Um, and so you can figure out based on what the principal, for a brittle material, what the principal stresses are in the body. We also gave a Tresca criteria and a von Mises criteria for failure. Uh, let's write those out here. Tresca and on Mises criteria, which uh, the Tresca is slightly more conservative than the von Mises. Basically, you take that maximum normal stress and you cut off the corners here. Uh, da, da, da. And a von Mises, you round out that surface a little bit. Uh, yeah. uh, so here you would have some sigma yield some minus sigma yield. The Tresca condition, both of these apply for ductile materials generally. 
ductile materials. The Tresca criteria says failure happens failure when uh, the maximum shear stress in the material is greater than the yield, uh, the shear yield stress, shear yield, which is also the uniaxial stress over two. And I can say that the max uh, shear stress relates to my principal stresses as the max of sigma one minus sigma two over two, sigma one minus sigma three over two, and sigma one minus, or sigma two minus sigma three, uh, minus sigma, nope, didn't erase that at all, minus sigma three over two. So I, I'm taking the maximum difference between my principal stresses, calling that my shear stress, and then saying when one of these terms exceeds my yield shear stress, then failure happens. For the von Mises, we have a, a slightly more convenient definition, or maybe not convenient, but um, von Mises, we have a slightly more complicated definition, but it's more convenient because it's a continuous function. So we say that there's some equivalent stress, um, sigma equivalent, which is equal to that big long square root thing, one half sigma one minus sigma two squared, sigma one minus sigma three squared, sigma two minus sigma three squared. There we go, I moved a half out to here. Uh, and failure happens, failure when that equivalence is greater than or equal to my yield stress. So this, both of these criteria are looking at shear uh, or shear stress as the deformation mechanism. Here von Mises looks at the total, basically combines all of the shear stresses in the material and looks at the total distortion of the material. Uh, so you can see Actually, there's, there's a lot of similarities here. Basically, these are all those shear stresses, one half the, the thing in here, uh, and it's taking effectively the average of all, or the, the gross sum of all of the shear stresses in the material, which is why this failure surface is a little bit more extended than the Tresca surface, whereas Tresca is only looking at individual shears in single directions. Um, but both of them say shear is the mechanism for failure. Um, I gave a couple other examples of like a, like a more Coulomb surface and a Drucker Prager surface that were um, similar to this. You don't necessarily need to know equations for it, but in general, know, uh, know that, know how to draw these types of surfaces for, um, say I gave you an anisotropic material, like a carbon fiber, and I said the yield intention was different than the yield in compression. Um, or the yield in direction one was different than the yield in direction two, and know that then once you draw that surface, if the stress is inside that surface or outside that surface, it survives or fails. Okay. Um, I think that's most of the material. Yeah. In a case like that, where you're just saying if you give us like the two stresses, would you tell us which criteria to use so that we know how to draw it, or is that something we need to be able to determine based on? you would determine it based on the type of material. So there might be a question that's like, oh, for a ductile material, what yield criteria would you use? And so knowing when to apply each one um, is important. Um, similar type question, like that type of question, how would you know if the lines should be vertical or horizontal? Like, what would be Uh, so you would only have, um, so I would only be asking you to draw like a, a von Mises or a map of equivalent to that. Um, for, so the, the idea behind a max normal stress is 
when any one of the principal stresses exceeds the tensile or compressive yield stress, then failure starts. And it ignores the fact that shear can cause failure. So uh, the difference for like a, a more Coulomb is you just take this and you, you draw a diagonal line there and you kind of cut that off and say, oh, shear can also cause failure. But in general, you don't have to worry about that. It'll either be a, a max normal or a Tresca or von Mises criteria. Yes, so that's exactly it. You would want to use Tresca if you were being more conservative. Oh. So Von Mises is generally more accurate for ductile materials. It'll match up with the failure surface a little bit better. But if you want to, kind of like adding in a factor of safety, um, if you want to just like add in that little extra margin of uh, let's make sure I'm, I'm under... I'm designing uh, based on the worst case scenario. I'm designing conservatively. Then you would use a, a the Tresca yield instead. Yeah. So if something's not a ductile material or a brittle material, what would you wouldn't use like uh, max normal or Tresca or right? Uh, no. Okay. But what are you thinking of? Like in normal, probably there was more. Ah, yeah which is a composite material. So like in your tests uh, for lab, you, you have carbon fibers of brittle material and epoxy is not super ductile, but has some plasticity. Um, yeah, so then that adds in an extra interesting layer of complication that I probably won't put in the midterm. Um, but yeah, that's a whole different interesting scenario that is why we gave it to you for the tension lab. Yeah. Um, a quick note for both of these. So this also relates to, um, I guess, uh, stress transformations and principal stress directions. Let's say you had some body that was being stressed in some arbitrary direction. Um, you would want to be able to then resolve this out and say what the directions of principal stress are. So find out at what, uh, let's draw from here, find out what angle away your principal stresses are and say in that direction along, basically if, if failure were to happen in the brittle material, it would happen in a plane orthogonal to your maximum stress direction. And if it were to happen in the ductile material, you would have uh, this rotated by 45 degrees and that's your direction of maximum shear. So your principal stress, uh, max principal stress, principal orientation is 45 degrees away from max shear, shear. So then here, if I were to redraw this now as, um, some max shear direction. This would now be that um, theta plus or minus 45 degrees, and you would have some shears, also still some axial stresses. Um, but this would be your, your maximum shear orientation. And then failure would be happening along that maximum shear, along those maximum shear planes. So this is kind of a tricky concept or potentially challenging concept, but it's one that's useful to consider when thinking about. Uh, so not only are you are you trying to figure out what what criteria you use for failure, you have to relate that criteria that you're using for failure to what direction things are failing in, which again is why that chalk fails at 45 degrees when we twist it, um, because we're looking at the the direction of maximum tension, uh, which is 45 degrees to our direction of maximum shear. Cool.
questions on things. None. Yeah. So I threw solutions on, on the website, but I didn't give any explanation for them. So I just gave the answer to them. Um, along with some dis some description of the answer, but none of the work to show how I got to that answer necessarily. Yeah. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, one concept for beam bending that I think lots of people missed in the homework. So when we're when we're looking at Euler Bernoulli theory, uh, so Euler Bernoulli beam theory. The main assumption for Euler Bernoulli theory is that plane sections remain plane. So plane sections remain plane. So then if I have a bent beam, the if I had something that started like something attached to it that started orthogonal to that, it would stay orthogonal. But the this is an assumption that the that the Euler Bernoulli beam theory is making. It's not the assumption that makes or it's not the condition that makes that a valid assumption. So in the homework I had asked what uh, when is when is the Euler Bernoulli theory valid? And that this assumption is valid when you have a few things. Uh, when you have a, a slender slender beam primarily uh, being that that's the main assumption. And then if a beam is slender, then you can assume that this generally holds true. Um, you also have to have loading in one direction, and you have to have small deflection. Small deflection. And uh, loading, you, you can't have loading from multiple axes. So if I, if I were to have a beam, I was pushing it up from two different sides, I couldn't use Euler-Bernoulli theory, for example. Um, but the main the main assumption there is that beams are slender. And then, or the main the main criteria for the Euler-Bernoulli assumption to be valid is that the beam is slender. There we go. Cool. So, we got like 10, 11 minutes left. Uh, what would you all like to talk about? Problem, I, I can talk through the practice problems, I can talk through homework problems. Did you go over practice problems? Yeah. <laughs> Thing wants to go. Cool. Yeah. So I, I graded these in terms of different levels of difficulty. Um, oh, this one was tricky. Yeah. yeah, that was that was probably like a level three one, yeah. realistically. Um, yeah, so there's one actually. Yeah, thanks thanks for asking this one. So there's one principle in here that I hadn't really talked about much, and that's the principle of superposition. So basically, if I have some arbitrary loading state uh, on a material, I can break that loading state up into pieces. So I can say. We also didn't talk about torque too much because um, we didn't go through, because I didn't have time to go through it. But uh, here, this is a beam, a circular rod two, 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 made of some steel. It's subjected to an axial force and a bending moment and a torque. So there's some stress in the axial direction, some moment here and then some torque being applied on top of the body. So I know basically in the, in the principle of superposition, I can take each of these individually and say that the stress total, the stress total is the stress from axial stress, uh, axial plus the stress from my bending plus the stress from my torsion. Uh, so from there, I know the axial stress, uh, sigma 
axial is just whatever that applied stress is. Zeros everywhere else. Uh, the stress from the bending moment. So now I guess I, I want to look at where the maximum stress is going to be happening, which is going to be along either the top or bottom side relative to the bending moment. Um, the torque is maximal along the outer edge of the surface. So torque, I didn't give you a relation for ship for. Uh, we'll talk about this next week on Monday because um, it's useful for the beam bending lab. But the torque relates, or the, the shear stress relates to torque as TR over J, where J is your uh, polar moment of inertia. There we go, yeah. So polar moment of inertia for a circular bar is pi over two over two r to the fourth. So it's similar in principle to your area moment, second moment of area, or second moment of area for, for the bending solution. Uh, just calculate it out in polar coordinates instead of in Cartesian coordinates. Uh, so here, the torque is going to give you some shear stress on the surface there. You're going to get some axial stress that's then added to by the bending moment. Um, and then that shear will be acting in the xy plane. So your bending stress, sigma bend, is equal to then some uh, sigma axial. There's no shear stress at the top. Uh, and I think it's just zeros everywhere else, right? Yes. Uh, and then the torque, sigma <laughs> torque. Oh, I think my pen is dying. No, now I have to use my not erasable pen. Okay. Now if I make mistakes, if I make mistakes, we're just we're just done. Um, so my torque, I'm adding in stresses along here. So then the total stress in the end is the or the maximum stress which is happening up here at that top or bottom point, uh, whichever side is in tension because of the moment I'm applying an axial tension and a bending. I want the tension from bending. Um, I would have the axial stress there plus the stress from bending and then the torque, torque, zeros, zeros, everywhere else. These are dependent on my diameter now. So the bending stress, sigma, sigma bend is that m, uh, this is now r over pi over 4 r to the fourth, uh, or I can throw in a d in there, uh, and then my torque, maximum torque, or torque in general, is t r over pi over r to the fourth. Um, so I can plug both of those in, and basically I, I would take this, find principal stress directions, um, or not find principal stress directions. Uh, no, I'm going to call this a ductile material. So I would plug these into a von Mises criteria, solve that out for, um, in solve that out in terms of my R, and then relate that to my yield strength, and then figure out back calculate out what my R needs to be. You actually end up with a sixth order polynomial that you have to solve, which is kind of a gross one. Um, yeah, this, this question is way harder than what would have been on the midterm, uh, or what will be on the midterm. Yeah, so you solve out that six order polynomial, figure out what that D needs to be. Once you get D, you can plug those back in to get stresses. Um, and then if you assume it's ductile, you go back to this idea of failure along the maximal shear direction. So you can take uh, principal stresses of the body and figure out directions. Just clarifying, can your sigma bend the sigma AX like, like up top? Oh yeah, the these... The AX that you have, is that... That's the same. Um, that's just like the um, stress created by the moment, right? The yeah. Over I. yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so this is your MZ over I here. 
torque is also torque R over J. Um, yeah. So this was this was a way more complicated problem than will be on the midterm. Um, but this idea is one that I wanted to come across. I probably should have made it a little bit simpler. But um, yeah, that idea of superposition is, is a useful one. Cool. More questions, other problems? No, don't worry about torque being on the on the midterm. Um, I yeah, because we went through it last minute. I don't think I gave it on any homework problems, and we're gonna have a lab on it next week anyway. Yeah, I, I'll probably be leaving it off the midterm. So normally, uh, changing a fact for safety will like shrink or grow the failure envelope. Uh huh. But switching from like a above thesis to the criteria changes the shape of the failure envelope. Is there anything special about the parts that get removed that makes them more likely to fail? Like in, in that region of the graph? Uh, what do you mean? Like when you go from a, a one thesis to a truss set, there's like certain uh, cords almost that you cut off of the ellipse. Yeah. Is there something there's about like those specific regions that makes them more likely to fail than, say, the vertex of Tresca? Or is it kind of arbitrary? Uh, you mean why would failure be more likely to occur in here than yes. there? Uh, so I guess it, it sort of depends on what your material is, but in general this, this is saying failure would happen if the shear in any one direction surpasses the maximum shear stress. So if you had a material where those shears didn't relate to each other, say shear was, I don't know, you, you had like weak planes holding together a material, you only care about shear in one direction, then a von Mises criteria wouldn't make sense necessarily. Okay, so for like, like wood and other things, like those types of positive material? Yeah, a Tresca criteria might be better for, or not quite because they're anisotropic, but looking at a maximum stress or maximum shear stress instead of a equivalent stress might be better. Yeah. Okay, I'll see you all on Friday.